Hello, thank you for joining me today. Linda Lamp here. We've been reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text, and today we're going to start on chapter 22, Salvation and the Holy Relationship. I think I'll try and do the introduction and section two uh, in this one reading today. So salvation and the holy relationship, introduction. Take pity on yourself, so long enslaved. Rejoice whom God hath joined, have come together and need no longer look on sin apart. No two can look on sin together for they could never see it in the same time and place. Sin is a strictly individual perception seen in the other yet believed by each to be within himself. And each one seems to make a different error and the one the other cannot understand. Brother, it is the same made by the same and forgiven for its maker in the same way. The holiness of your relationship, you and your brother, undoing the effects of what you both believed and saw. And with their going is the need for sin gone with them. Who has need for sin? Only the lonely and alone who see their brothers different from themselves. It is this difference seen but not real that makes the need for sin. But not, but not real but seen seem justified. Let me read that sentence again. It is this difference, seen but not real, that makes the need for sin, not real but seen, seem justified. And, and let's go back to the beginning of this paragraph for a second. Who has need for sin? Only the lonely and alone who see their brothers different from themselves. It is this difference, seen but not real, that makes the need for sin, not real but seen, seem justified. And all this would be real if sin were so, for an unholy relationship is based on differences where each one thinks the other has what he has not. They come together each to complete himself and rob the other. They stay until they think that there is nothing left to steal and then move on. And so they wander through a world of strangers, unlike themselves, living with their bodies, perhaps under a common roof that shelters neither in the same room, yet a world apart. A holy relationship starts from a different premise. Each one has looked within and seen no lack. Accepting his completion, he would extend it by joining with another whole as himself. He sees no difference between those selves, for differences are only of the body. Therefore, he looks on nothing he would take. He denies not his own reality because it is the truth. Just under heaven does he stand, but close enough not to return to earth. For this relationship has heaven's holiness. How far from home can a relationship so like to heaven be? Think what a holy relationship can teach. Here is a belief in differences undone. Here is the faith in differences shifted to sameness. Reason now can lead you and your brother to the logical conclusion of your union. It must extend as you extended when you joined. It must reach out beyond itself as you reached out beyond the body to let yourselves be joined and differences so that the sameness that lies beneath them all becomes apparent. Here is the golden circle where you recognize the Son of God. For what is born into a holy relationship can never end. And we'll read on. So we're in chapter 22, Salvation and the Holy Relationship, section 2, The Message of the Holy Relationship. 
let reason take another step. If you attack whom God would heal and hate the one he loves, then you and your creator have a different will. Yet if you are his will, what you must then believe is that you are not yourself. You can indeed believe this, and you do. And you have faith in this and see much evidence on its behalf. And where, you wonder, does your strange uneasiness, your sense of being disconnected, and your haunting fear of lack of meaning in yourself arise? It is as though you wandered in without a plan of any kind, except to wander off, for only that seems certain. Yet you have heard a similar description earlier, but it was not of you. But still, this strange idea that it does accurately describe, you think is you. Reason would tell you that the world you see through eyes that are not yours must make no sense to you. To whom would seeing such as this send back its messages? Surely not you, whose sight is wholly independent of the eyes that look upon the world. If this is not your vision, what can it show to you? The brain cannot interpret what your vision sees. This you would understand. The brain interprets to the body to which it is a part, but it says you cannot understand. Yet you have listened to it, and long and hard you try to understand its messages. You have not realized it is impossible to understand what fails entirely to reach you. You have received no messages at all, you understand. For you have listened to what can never communicate at all. Think then what happens, denying what you are, and firm in faith that you are something else, this something else that you have made yourself to be, yourself becomes your sight. Yet it must be, it must be the something else that sees and not you explains its sight to you. Your vision would, of course, render this quite unnecessary. Yet if your eyes are closed and you have called upon this thing to lead you, asking it to explain to you the world it sees, you have no reason not to listen nor to suspect that what it tells you is not true. Reason would tell you it cannot be true because you do not understand it. God has no secrets. He cannot lead you through a world of misery waiting to tell you at the journey's end why he did this to you. What could be secret from God's will? Yet you believe that you have secrets. What could your secrets be except another will that is your own apart from his? Reason would tell you that this is no secret and it need be hidden, hidden as a sin, but a mistake indeed. Let not your fear of sin protect it from correction, for the attraction of guilt is only fear. Here is the one emotion that you made, whatever it may seem to be. This is the emotion of secrecy, the private thoughts of the body. This is the one emotion that opposes love and always leads to sight of differences and loss of sameness. Here is the one emotion that keeps you blind, dependent on the self you think you may to lead you through the world it made for you. Your sight was given you along with everything else that you understand. You will perceive no difficulty in understanding what this vision tells you, for everyone sees only what he thinks he is. And what your sight would show you, you will understand because it is the truth. Only your vision can convey to you what you can see. It reaches you directly without a need to be interpreted to you. What needs interpretation must not be what oh what what needs interpretation must be alien 
nor will it ever be made understandable by an interpreter you cannot understand. Of all the messages you have received and fail to understand, this course alone is open to your understanding and can be understood. This is your language. You do not understand it yet only because your whole communication is like a baby's. The sounds a baby makes and what he hears are highly unreliable, meaning different things to him at different times. Neither the sound he hears nor sights he sees are yet stable. But what he hears and does not understand will be his negative will be his native tongue through which he will communicate with those around him and they with him. And the strange shifting ones he sees about him will become to him his comforters and he will recognize his home and he will see them there with him. So in each holy relationship is the ability to communicate itself instead of separate, reborn. Yet a holy relationship so reluctantly reborn itself from an unholy relationship, and yet more ancient than the old illusion it has replaced, is like a baby now in its rebirth. Still in this infant is your vision returned to you and he will speak the language you can understand. He is not nurtured by the something else you thought was you. He was not given there, nor was received by anything except yourself. For no two brothers can unite except through Christ, whose vision sees them one. Think what is given you, my holy brother. This child will teach you what you do not understand and make it plain. For he will be no alien tongue. He will need no interpreter to you. For it was you who taught him what he knows because you knew it. He could not come to anyone but you, never to something else. Where Christ has entered, no one is alone, for never could he find a home in separate ones. Yet must he be reborn into his ancient home, so seeming new and yet as old as he, a tiny newcomer, dependent on the holiness of your relationship to let him live. Be certain God did not entrust his son to the untrustworthy. Nothing but what is part of him is worthy of being joined. Nor is it possible that anything not, of, not part of him can join. Communication must have been restored to those who join, for this they could not do through bodies. What then has joined them? Reason will tell you that they must have seen each other through a vision not of the body and communicated in a language the body does not speak. Nor could it be a fearful sight or sound that drew them gently into one. Rather, in each, the other saw a perfect shelter where his self could be reborn in safety and in peace. Such did he return. Sorry, such did his reason tell him. Such he believed because it was the truth. Here is the first direct perception you, that you can make. You make it through awareness older than perception and yet reborn in just an instant. For what is time to what was always so? Think what that instant brought, the recognition that the something else you thought was you is an illusion that truth came instantly to show you where yourself must be. It is denial of illusions that calls on truth, for to deny illusions is to recognize that fear is meaningless. Into the holy home where fear is powerless, love enters thankfully, grateful that it is one with you who joined to let it enter. 
Christ comes to what is like himself, the same, not different, for he is always drawn to himself. What is as like him as a holy relationship? And what draws you together draws you to, I'm sorry, and what draws you together draws him to you. Here are his sweetness and his gentle innocence protected from attack. And here he can return in confidence, for faith in another is always faith in him. You are indeed correct in looking on each other as his chosen home, for here you will with him and with his. All right, I got to read that again. You are indeed correct in looking on each other as his chosen home, for here you will with him and with his father. This is your father's will for you and yours with his. And who is drawn to Christ is drawn to God as surely as both are drawn to every holy relationship, the home prepared for them as earth is turned to heaven. This is very profound right at the end. Uh, when this is talking about oneness and, and how basically Christ lives in each of us. And that it is this trinity, you know, of, of the Father, the Son, and, and, and the Holy Ghost, you know, more and more to me the meaning of the Holy Ghost is our spirit, our soul. Because this is what it says. This is your father's will for you and yours with his. So we are joined with God in our purpose. And who is drawn to Christ is drawn to God. As surely as both are always are drawn to every holy relationship. So it is you, Christ, and the Father, or great parent, I like to call it. They are in you. They are you. You are them. There is no separation. If you're at all familiar with the book I've written, Walking Through Your Walls, I've been doing live readings, and today just happened to be a chapter where we, we talk about this in, in detail. There's only one substance here on this planet. That's it. It's all the same stuff. It's shaped into different things. It looks different in our appearance. But the bottom line is, scientifically, it's a fact. We know. It's proven. The only thing that exists is one medium. And it's mostly space. Even that is mostly space. And that's what this book is trying to tell us to. We're all one. There isn't anything else. That's it. Divinity. Divinity, not in form, divinity in form, but it's all divinity, your divinity. Whether you feel it or not, whether you act like it or not, it doesn't matter. You are divinity in form, in physical 3D form. And when you leave that form, you will be divinity in wholeness, back in the one So I hope this uh, I hope this section uh, has uh, works for you, <laughs> makes some sense, and uh, I hope you'll join me. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope you'll join me next Sunday for the next installment of uh, A Course in Miracles. Thank you so much. Much love and namaste.